Madhukar Swayambhu has been an IT communication network professional for over two decades and since 2011 has become a researcher, an environmentalist, ecologist, inventor, entrepreneur, biodiversity conservationist, a water hero, a TED speaker, and a recognized global top three author on water by Smart Water Magazine, Spain. He has also represented India at various international forums. What you see in front of your screen is all about water. You can see that there is a waterfall and there is a lot of water falling down uh, the fall. Uh, what is very, very important about water is it is the living link between life above water and below water. And uh, it has a major, major role to play because we all understand in all our space exploration, uh, the first thing that any space agency would be uh, trying to find out on a moon or on another planet is water. So water is the key essential uh, requirement for any kind of life to exist. Uh, so we'll explore through uh, the different properties of water and why water is so important. Uh, through the presentation. So let me just uh, move on with the presentation. Let's first understand about myths and half-truths about water. First and foremost, H2O. Uh, yes, definitely water is H2O, but that doesn't give you the complete persona of water. Like uh, if I tell you, uh, here's my blood report, now you can understand everything about me. It's not practically possible because I am way beyond my blood report. So what we understand about water uh, beyond H2O is, uh, if you call water as substance, all the substances on this planet will contract once frozen. Water is the only uh, substance which will expand when it is frozen. That is why ice floats on water because ice is lighter than water. Then uh, you have buoyant force in water which is acting against the force of gravity, right? So this is giving you the, the kind of mysticism that water has as a basic property because it has got a force which is working against gravity. It does exist in all the three forms, solid, liquid, and gas. So if it is just merely H2O, I mean, it is very tough to understand why does it have so many properties which are way different from any other molecule right? Like H2O, hydrogen is combustible, oxygen is combustible, but when they join together, H2O becomes an extinguisher, right? So there are a lot of properties of the persona of water which are way ahead of just merely being a molecule of H2O. Second, let's understand through this picture, I, I hope everybody would have gone through this in their primaries, right? This is what we have learned about water cycle. But this is again a half truth because there is no mention about the aquifers or the groundwater. Now, a, a country which is as huge as Bharat or India, we have got 75% dependency on the groundwater. And that is not at all a part of this water cycle, right? Then if you look at the rivers, where do rivers come in from? As per the water cycle, glacier melts and rivers get formed, right? Uh, and then river flows towards the ocean or the sea. And then the evaporation happens and the cloud is created. But uh, if you look at uh, most of the rivers uh, towards uh, the central Bharat or down south, there are no glaciers at all. So what is creating these... Uh, rivers. All these rivers have got their origin from a water body. That means the water is oozing out from the soil, right? So the origin is not a glacier. And then what decides the route? If you drop water from a glass, it will fall straight. It will not go like a spiral movement or, or a serpent's movement, right? But then why do rivers behave like that? Because the entire path of the river is decided from where all the water is oozing out. So there is a river above the surface and there is a river below the surface. And both of them are connected through soil capillaries. Now this is something which is not taught into the water cycle. Again, uh, another phenomena which you will 
come to know if uh, you study oceanography, which says that if uh, a river on the surface will dry down, the ocean level will go up. If the river on the surface is the source of water to the ocean, surface river dries down, the water level of the ocean will go up. So that means our understanding of the water cycle is somewhere not complete, right? So those were some of the myths and the half-truths. Now let's move about the scientific understanding of water that we have today. Let's uh, start from the evolution. So the evolution of life, if, if you look at this picture, it uh, talks about how life has evolved on the planet from prokaryotes to eukaryotes to, pro to protozoa. These are all single-celled organisms. But everything began in water. It was all marine life till fishes, till uh, the Cambrian explosion, and even after that. Right. So for about 500 million years or 420 million years, the entire phenomena called life was evolving only within water. It was for the first time after 420 million years when the life started propagating towards the land. That was when you found amphibians, like we have frogs, uh, we have certain varieties of crabs, uh, turtles, uh, your uh, crocs, crocodiles, right? All of them are moving towards the land. And that created the amphibian uh, variety of life. And then life reached uh, the territorial surface, wherein we had all those, those mammals and primates and all that. And then we had birds. Now, in this entire chain, if you look at it, the one thing which is absolutely common to all of them is water. Without water, none of them can survive. Right? Again, when it comes to the terrestrial life also, uh, majorly the terrestrial life is aerobic, which means they need oxygen to breathe in. Right? Now, whenever we talk about oxygen, we start talking about... Uh, basically plantation and tree plantation and all that. But we forget that more than 50% of the atmospheric oxygen is actually produced by water and water bodies. All of them are actually emitting oxygen, right? Otherwise, if it was only for the plants, then traveling from Bharat to Australia wouldn't have been possible because there's a huge ocean around, right? And if there was no oxygen above the oceans, then how would the sailors survive? Right. So there is a major, major role for water to maintain the soil moisture beneath the air moisture, uh, uh, the, the vapors and uh, the life within the water bodies. So moving on from here, if we understand the latest scientific understandings about water, water has got a very distinct uh, style of movement, which is spiral. Water doesn't flow straight. And this was discovered by Dr. Victor Schaubeger from Austria, uh, somewhere in 1950s. Uh, and then he published a paper, uh, which was published after his death, almost about uh, 15, 20 years later, uh, from uh, the research paper of University of Austria. And what he explained why uh, was uh, why do whirlpools get formed? Because if the water molecules are moving spirally, the moment you uh, you have uh, a dip in the flow, uh, this spiral movement will go vertical and whirlpools are formed. Uh, then we have uh, Dr. Marasu Emoto from Japan, who did a lot of research from 1984 till uh, year 202. And uh, he explained that water has got a stimulus to the environment in which it exists. So uh, he took two pots of water, one he kept in a temple, another one he kept in a slaughterhouse. And uh, after 24 hours, he collected those pots and uh, created water crystals out of it. And you could actually make it out just from the formation of the crystal 
that one was an absolutely beautiful blissful uh, crystal another one was a very uh, wicked kind of a crystal so you could actually make out that okay this is from the slaughterhouse and this is from the temple right and then we have uh, dr jacques banwanist uh, from france who explained that water has got a memory uh, obviously his uh, paper was uh, unable to establish it firmly uh, but then his experiment was further extended by Dr. Luc Montier in the recent times. And his entire experiment is there on YouTube. He conducted the entire experiment in front of media, in front of camera. What he did was, uh, he is actually a Nobel laureate. He got the Nobel uh, award for uh, discovering the HIV virus. And um, he did an experiment with the HIV infected DNA itself, which is uh, a rare possibility. He took that DNA, put that into one test tube, then took one drop of this test tube, put it into another test tube. And like that, he diluted it 24 times. Then he recorded the sound waves coming out of water, captured that into a wave file, emailed it to another set of scientists waiting for this email in uh, Milan in Italy wherein they took fresh water uh, in a test tube, uh, which was the fresh tap water in Milan. And they made this new uh, test tube listen to that entire wave file. After which, when they put a DNA binder into it, they were able to recreate that entire HIV infected DNA. Right. So in this experiment, what he was able to prove that water is able to listen, water is able to record, water is able to communicate, memorize and even translate what it has heard. Right. So definitely water is way beyond H2O. Now, water is uh, sustaining life only because it creates an environment, it creates a conducive environment for life to sustain in the vicinity because water body is a heat sink it absorbs heat from around. Uh, so if the water bodies are healthy, definitely we have a solution to global warming, right? Uh, water is a carbon sink. If we create healthy water bodies performing the natural uh, uh, ecosystem services to the vicinity, then our uh, global warming problems are also sorted because number one, it is a heat sink. Number two, it is a carbon sink. So the key takeaways, Earth is the only planet where we have water and 73% of uh, the globe is water. So is 73% of the human body. That is also water. Then we have certain plants like sugarcane, which has got 90% water. 50% of the atmospheric oxygen is actually produced by the water bodies. No plant, animal or bird species can survive without water. So water is precious. And water is the only, water bodies are the only structure which can be emitters also, which can be sequesters also, provided we maintain their health. If they are in healthy condition, they are the sinks. If they are in poor health, they will start emitting the greenhouse gases. So it is rather our most uh, important responsibilities to maintain the health of the water bodies so that the entire planet remains sustainable. So that is what is the goal of our UN SDGs, uh, to ensure sustainability of life on the planet, above water and below water. And that is how water becomes a living link between both the kinds of uh, lives, both above water and below water. And it is definitely economy as well, because all the tourist destinations are next to the water bodies. So if you maintain the health of the water bodies, it is not just giving you uh, a conducive environment for life sustainability, but it is also giving you a recession-free economy. So maintain the water bodies in a healthy condition. Uh, so that's about it. That ends my presentation.